Military theorists have worked tirelessly on predicting who would win in certain war situations. One of the most popular setups these days is NATO versus Russia and China, along with Iran and North Korea. The problem is NATO also includes the United States, the most powerful military on Earth, with the rest of the combined forces of NATO a strong second. China would come in third if for no other reason than its massive army made up of more than 2 million men and women, and the growing size of its fleet. Russia is barely in this picture, its economy has taken a huge tumble in the first year of its invasion of Ukraine, while its navy is bottled up in the Black Sea, and they've lost more than half of their pre-invasion tank total. The problem has gotten so bad that they're literally pulling 80-year-old relics out of museums and boneyards and then sending them to the front. At this point, Poland is actually preparing to build up its military to be on equal par with Russia. NATO also includes the countries of the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Italy, Turkey, Spain, and now Finland, along with 24 other European countries. Meanwhile, Russia has seen its military fortune spiraling downward. As of November 2022, Russia has lost more than 200,000 soldiers, along with 160 generals and another 1,350 officers in just the first nine months of the war, according to estimates by the U.S. Center for Naval Analysis. They've not been able to establish air superiority over Ukraine, a country one quarter of its population, in part because of the continuing shipments of advanced weaponry from the US and NATO countries. Iran has been of limited help to Russia, insofar that they've been able to supply them with their Shahed-136 suicide drone systems. Unfortunately for Iran, it's been discovered that their drones contained Western-made parts that have somehow escaped the sanctions imposed on Russia. Once these transactions were made known, the Western companies involved have apparently tightened their overseas shipments. Unless Iran can begin to reproduce such advanced and miniaturized technical components, their stockpile of drones will dwindle and not be replaced. North Korea is far down the list of useful allies. Their military, while strong in numbers, over 1.28 million soldiers, is extremely backwards and has barely advanced beyond its 1960s technology. They've been making efforts to improve their nuclear weapon missile program, but for this scenario, those weapons are off the table. Of course, any war between such great powers would have to exclude nuclear weapons. No one will win if city-killing nuclear weapons were tossed about. As few as 50 Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons hitting cities anywhere on the globe would cause enough soot and other pollution in the skies that the planet would suffer climactic effects unprecedented in human history and could start what's known as a nuclear winter. In that scenario, harvests would fail, mass starvation would follow, and the world economy and technological society as we know it would crumble within weeks. Hopefully all the powers involved are aware of this and would refrain from making such a bad choice as to resort to nukes, even tactical ones. The question is, is there a situation under which NATO could be defeated by the combined efforts of China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea? Well, yes, but it would require a very unique set of situations with very precise elements that would be unlikely, perhaps nearly impossible, to occur all at the same time in the real world. But there is a possibility, so let's set up the parameters under which NATO could lose. The ABCs for a NATO loss we should state from the beginning that there is no way NATO would lose to what we will now call the Iron Coalition, with the United States and its military forces still involved. There would have to be a way to separate the US from its NATO allies, both militarily and economically. There are three scenarios that could make this a reasonable possibility. Part 1. When the levee breaks First, China and Russia could use electromagnetic pulse weapons or EMPs to take down the US electrical grid, as well as some of the US's overseas bases. There are debates about just how effective such an attack could be, and whether the US could knock down any missiles headed their way before they reached the proper altitude and location for them to explode. It is known, however, that both China and Russia have put an effort into making improved or advanced EMP weapons, ones that have thinner casing around the nuclear explosive material, thus releasing more of the gamma radiation that would cause the EMP pulse itself. We also know that China has already practiced sending balloons over the US, one of which, that we know of, in 2023 sailed across the entire continental US before being shot down off the East Coast. It's not impossible that China could miniaturize a small enough nuke that it would be transportable over the US by such a large balloon and which might evade US radar or simply be ignored by NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, as just another weather balloon. Or if China was sufficiently motivated, they could marry one of their state-of-the-art hypersonic missiles with an advanced EMP weapon, making for a first-strike capability that the US would be hard-pressed to stop. 
If such a weapon, or multiple weapons, were detonated over the U.S., the resulting turmoil and confusion might prohibit the U.S. from reacting quickly enough against any attack in Europe. These EMP pulses would not create any physical damage on the ground, but they could overload all the power grids in the U.S. together with most electronic technologies, from computers and cars to smartphones, that our daily lives depend on. The perceived threat that a second attack might follow, one in which more lethal nuclear weapons would be used against U.S. cities, might be enough to make the U.S. think twice about involving themselves in an overseas war. Again, this is a highly unlikely situation and totally speculative, but something like this would have to happen in order to drive a wedge between the U.S. and the other NATO countries. There's also a strong possibility that such an attack would include Canada as well, knocking them out of the alliance too. Part 2. Just click this link. The second part of such a plan would involve extensive cyber warfare. Three of the members of the Iron Coalition are known to harbor sophisticated hacking organizations, believed in each case to be actively supported by the respective government. China has three very active groups named Red Golf, APT-41, and Barium, whose activities are so closely overlapped that some experts believe they might all be part of a larger coordinated government operation. Two of the groups, Red Golf and APT-41, have proved to be using a version of the Keyplug backdoor malware program in addition to several other malicious software tools. These known groups have already hacked into at least six U.S. state government websites as well as hundreds of corporate and industrial organizations. Russia has its own rogue gallery of state-sponsored hacking groups. On May 9, 2023, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency CISA, and its Western partners released a joint advisory for a sophisticated cyber espionage tool used by Russian cyber groups called the Snake Malware Program. This is just the latest hacking effort that Russia has covertly supported in order to attack U.S. and Western countries' businesses, government-connected sites, and industrial elements. CISA has stated that the SNAKE program has infected everything from COVID-19 research, election organizations and government websites, to healthcare and pharmaceutical companies, defense industries, energy companies, nuclear and commercial power facilities, water controls, aviation coordination, and even video game manufacturers. These attacks are only the latest in a wave of what has been decades of such attacks directed from Russia. Before Snake, the same coordinated family of Russian-backed hackers were blamed for a number of high-profile malicious cyber attacks, including the compromise of the SolarWinds software supply chain in 2020, the targeting of companies developing COVID-19 vaccines also in 2020, attacks on the U.S. industrial control system infrastructure in 2018, the worldwide NotPetya ransomware attacks in 2017, and the leaks of stolen documents from the Democratic National Committee website prior to the 2016 presidential election. Not to be outdone by its two bigger brothers in cybercrime, North Korea has also supported its fair share of malicious software attacks. One group, known as the Lazarus Group, reportedly stole $100 million in cryptocurrency in June 2022. They were later caught laundering $60 million of that in January 2023. The Lazarus Group has been closely associated with the interests of North Korea for many years. Their most well-known attack was a cyber theft of $81 million from the Bank of Bangladesh in 2016. And who can forget the cyber attack on Sony Pictures in 2014 by a group that called themselves the Guardians of Peace? This was in direct response to Sony's release of a very unflattering comedy about a plot to assassinate North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. It's not inconceivable that these three countries could unite their various state-sponsored hacking and cybercrime organizations into a massive worldwide effort, something along the lines of the notorious 1930s organized crime group Murder Incorporated. Only this group would be known as Cyber Warfare Incorporated, and their crime would not be killing people but killing infrastructure. Such a group could target nationwide electrical grids, online power stations, airports and shipping facilities, government offices, hospitals and rail networks, even the internet itself. Since we're discussing what is basically a worst-case scenario, we could anticipate a massive cyber attack just before the EMP attack. The cyber criminals could severely degrade the ability for the US or any NATO country for that matter to coordinate its military as well as hampering any recovery from the follow-on EMP pulse. While most military hardware would be protected against the effects of some parts of the EMP wave, government and military infrastructure have proved to be far more vulnerable to cyber attacks. In 2008, for example, a single thumb drive incautiously plugged into a laptop at a U.S. base in the Middle East caused the biggest invasion of U.S. Department of Defense networks ever seen. It took the DoD more than 14 months to remove the virus, codenamed Agent.BTZ, from more than 300,000 computer systems. This attack led the Pentagon to create its own coordinated defense against future attacks, and thus the U.S. Cyber Command was born. 
But as that incident points out, humans are imperfect, even ones in the military. There are hundreds of ways to infect computers these days, from simple thumb drives to elaborate phishing attempts, even bribery and blackmail. For example, as recently as November 2022, the United Arab Emirates, supposedly an ally of the U.S., hired three former U.S. intelligence and military officials to help the UAE government break into computer networks in the U.S. and elsewhere. EMP attacks that knock out anything electrical that's unprotected, cyber attacks that invade every computer and network. What else could cause the U.S. to sit out in a war against NATO? Part 3. America first means everyone else is on their own. This is part three, when a U.S. political group decides to keep America out of the war. Both political parties in the U.S. have claimed that leaders in the other party are working hand-in-hand -hand with foreign governments. While we won't get into a deep political discussion here, we must remember that the U.S. has, from time to time, been reluctant to get into foreign wars, especially those in Europe. In World War I, a large percentage of Americans felt that Europe should stick to its own affairs and that the U.S. should remain neutral. Woodrow Wilson ran for president in 1916 with the policy he dubbed the America First Ideal, promising to keep the U.S. out of World War I known then as the Great War. There was a similar but even stronger anti-war movement launched in 1940, just a year before the U.S. was forcibly drawn into World War II by the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. This movement, led by U.S. celebrities like Henry Ford and Charles Lindbergh, was organized under the banner of the America First Committee. This may have been the strongest anti-war organization in U.S. history, with a peak membership base close to 850,000. In fact, it's been suggested that had Japan not attacked, the U.S.'s commitment to help Great Britain might have come too late, allowing Nazi Germany to defeat them, which would allow it to turn its entire focus on defeating the Soviet Union. It's not inconceivable, then, that a U.S. government might take a similar non-interventionist stance in the future, especially if they were threatened with nuclear weapons or if they had their hands full in dealing with the one-two punch of cyber attacks and EMP damage. The U.S. government might even think they were doing the right thing, hoping that NATO and the Iron Coalition would fight themselves to a draw, while the U.S. licked its electronic and cyber wounds and prepared for the world post-World War III. Comparing the Forces Involved this is all necessary for the Iron Coalition to consider a war against NATO that somehow China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea would keep the U.S. out of any hostilities. If that unique situation could be engineered, what else would the Iron Coalition need to be able to successfully engage NATO? First off, none of these four countries currently have the capability to transport enough troops to the European theater to even begin considering a land invasion. The 29 NATO member nations contain roughly 600 million people, excluding the U.S. and Canada's 365 million. And while without the U.S., NATO is still a sizable military force, the U.S. alone accounts for 1.3 million of the 3.5 million total NATO armed forces, or more than 35% of its possible strength. Yet, without its larger ally, NATO is considered a very advanced military force, in part due to its high-tech weaponry. The 29 remaining countries' combined navies operate nine large aircraft carriers, while Russia has only one, the Admiral Kuznetsov, perpetually in dry dock for repairs, while China has three, one of which is a training-only carrier with a fourth under construction. NATO's combined fighter aircraft total around 6,000, though they'd be missing the massive potential of the U.S.'s 13,000 fighter aircraft. But NATO employs many of the same fifth-generation fighter aircraft as the U.S., including the F-35 and F-15EX, as well as a similar fourth-generation aircraft of European manufacture like the French Rafale and the Eurofighter Typhoon. Meanwhile, Russia's Air Force has, to be honest, seen better days, so has their tank corps. Their navy is also in shambles. But what was Russia's military really designed to do? Since the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, their military has degraded year by year. There is no longer a threat to the West. Russia's military is currently designed almost exclusively to combat threats along its own border. They have occasionally sent some of their best equipment to foreign wars in Syria, but even then their equipment did not function as well as they'd hoped. And when pitted against Western forces, their ground troops also failed. In the only actual combat between U.S. forces and Russian regulars, the 2018 Battle of Kasham in Syria, a handful of U.S. Marines and Army Special Forces, together with a small group of Syrian Democratic Forces SDF fighters, were attacked by a group of some 250 mixed Russian Wagner mercenaries and Syrian pro-government militia who were attempting to cross the Euphrates southwest of Kasham. U.S. forces fired a few artillery rounds to warn them off, and they initially pulled back. 
But later in the evening, around 10 p.m., the U.S. troops were surprised to detect a column of Russian T-72 tanks and support vehicles, along with as many as 500 soldiers, heading toward their position from the east side of the Euphrates. The U.S. troops called in massive air and artillery support, involving fighter jets, bombers, gunships, attack helicopters, and drones, in addition to howitzer artillery and high Mars rockets. The Russian and Syrian forces never got within rifle range of their U.S. targets. Four hours later, when the fighting was over, more than 100 of the attacking forces had been killed, though some Russian estimates put the losses at more than 300. The only casualties on the U.S. SDF side was a single wounded SDF soldier. The only way Russian troops can be expected to successfully attack NATO countries is with massive help. From the much more numerous and, frankly, at this point better supplied Chinese Army, the People's Liberation Army, or PLA, and their Air Force, the PLA-AF. But how would China manage to get enough of their ground and air forces to Western Russia in order to launch a ground attack against Poland, Germany, France, and Italy to make a difference? The little engine that could, maybe, possibly. Again, we must take liberties with reality. Russia has long desired to improve cross-border cooperation with China. The April 2023 meeting between Presidents Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping were expected to culminate in an agreement to improve the cooperation between the two countries via new pipelines and potentially an improved rail network. Though this agreement never materialized, it's not out of the realm of possibility. China has invested billions into a continent-spanning program called the Belt and Road Program, designed to link together multiple nations with oil and mineral reserves that China needs in order to power its economy, which is heavily dependent on imports from overseas. Forget for the moment that the Belt and Road Program is heavily in debt, more than a trillion dollars worth, and is on the brink of bankruptcy in many of the countries where its projects have been funded. Instead, let's paint a best-case scenario. Let's assume instead that many of the countries that China has linked began to repay their loans, and China has the funds and inclination to increase its rail network all the way up to the Trans-Siberian Railway. With that infrastructure in place, and a healthy building program to create hundreds if not thousands of rail cars, China could begin shipping troops and some equipment on what would be a 7-8 to eight day journey from the Far East to Moscow. From there, a simple one or two days further rail transit would bring them to the border of Poland, or even further west into Russia's few remaining vassal states, Belarus. It is even conceivable that some of North Korea's massive army could also hitch a ride on this vast little engine that could rail network, while they still use Korean War era tanks, and their air force is not really worthy of that name. They do have more than 6,000 pieces of artillery to supplement their 1.28 million man army. China could add its more than 3,700 tanks and 4,500 artillery pieces as well, as Soviet leader Stalin once reportedly said, quantity has a quality all its own. While we're stretching the limits of what might be possible by imagining such massive transfers of men and machines across the longest rail line in the world, there are three points that must be stressed. First, while these plans may seem impossible, they are completely doable given enough time and money and determination. Second, there would be no way to hide such a buildup from today's world of satellite and global reconnaissance. Third, and most importantly, even if NATO detected these transfers, there's not a thing NATO could do about it. NATO is first and foremost a defensive organization. They couldn't strike first if they wanted to, and they're made up of 29 separate countries not including the US and Canada, with 29 different governments and 29 different countries that they'd then have to answer to. We've seen how little good it did to know Putin was massing an invading army on the borders of Ukraine. Until Russia actually invaded, there wasn't anything Ukraine or anyone else could do except to prepare for such a massive attack. Taking to the skies To oppose NATO's US-less air force of some 6,000 fixed-wing aircraft, China could bring in more than 3,000 of their own combat aircraft to supplement Russia's 3,800. But while Russia's air force is losing numbers and often being shown as ineffective against Ukraine's air defense systems, China's air force is growing. They recently began deploying their competitor to the 5th Gen F-35, the Chengdu J-20. And China is also trying to compete with the US's planned 6th Gen aircraft with their own prototype, which looks so much like the US Next Generation Air Dominance Fighter or NGAD that some analysts have called it a copycat. China has been known to use its vast networks of hackers to steal designs from US defense industries without robust security protocols on their networks. They've also back-engineered almost every Russian high-tech system they've ever bought, from the S-400 missile system to the frontline Su-35 fighter. It's not unlikely, then, that China's attempting to do the same with both the F-22 and the NGAD prototypes. A very real deficit. 
One lesson learned from Russia's invasion of Ukraine, however, is that no airspace is safe when the soldiers below are using manned portable air defense systems or man pads, like the Stinger missile, or in the case of tanks and armored personnel carriers within range of javelins or other anti-tank missile systems. While it's clear that Russia has struggled against such a hostile environment, again, they've lost nearly half their pre-invasion force of 4,000 main battle tanks, let's make another assumption that isn't far from the mark. In the beginning of 2023, the United States had sent nearly 7,000 javelins to Ukraine, more than a third of its entire stockpile. While the U.S. has orders to purchase another 1,800 to help replenish those stockpiles, it's noticeable the rate these weapons are being used far outweighs the ability for the weapons manufacturers to create new ones. The same has been found with artillery shells and missiles. Both Ukraine and Russia are going through their existing stockpiles at an alarming rate. By May 2023, the leader of the Wagner private military company, Yevgeny Prigozhin, was complaining bitterly and publicly that they were only receiving a tenth of the promised artillery shells they felt they needed. Meanwhile, reports from January 2023 suggest Russia may run out of missiles as early as the end of May. Indeed, Russia's ferocious bombardment of Ukrainian cities by their missiles and long-range rockets slowed appreciably in April. But what if China turned its vast manufacturing empire toward the mass production of these systems? Could China produce two to 3,000 javelins or stingers per month? They could certainly outproduce what the NATO countries are currently producing. And if, in our best possible reality for the Iron Coalition scenario, the US chose to stay out of any attack on NATO, then the vast supplies of US-made anti-tank missiles and man-pad systems would not be available to them. The same would be true of artillery shells. North Korea and Iran are already supplying artillery shells to Russia, at least 300,000 in the case of Iran, and as many as 1 million shells from North Korea, though that number is in dispute. It's conceivable, then, that such transfers of material support would not only continue, but would increase. The sad but inescapable results. When we add all this together, here's what we have. NATO, standing alone, devoid of its largest and most powerful member country, the United States. China, Russia, and North Korea, with the largest combined hacking network ever seen, able to take down most government, industrial, and infrastructure websites. China and Russia's willingness to use EMP weapons to keep the US at arm's length and possibly against Europe as well. An interconnected railway system between Russia and China that allows for an expedited movement of overwhelming numbers of Chinese and North Korean troops and military hardware to the eastern borders of NATO. China and Iran, and possibly North Korea, using their combined industrial might to supply all the artillery shells, drones, and missiles and rockets that a massive assault against NATO would require. The bottom line is, with all these elements in place, it would be nearly impossible for the Iron Coalition to lose. After such a massive force crashes into Poland, rolls across many of the smaller nations like Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, and into Germany, and then positions itself to strike deep into the Balkan states, with Italy and France next, it's likely that individual nations will begin to make hurried and separate peace agreements with China and Russia, possibly leaving the United Kingdom to fight on alone, until the barrage of missiles devastates their navy so badly they surrender on somewhat agreeable terms. This is not a pleasant scenario, and while it's highly unlikely, there is a non-zero possibility that this could happen. Nothing that we've described here is impossible. The time frame might take years, the coordination might require huge compromises on the part of the four attacking nations, and almost everything possible would have to go right for the Iron Coalition to succeed. The sun will come out. But this is very unlikely to happen, to say the least. It's clear to most economic observers that China, despite an unprecedented increase of improving and expanding much of its military, especially its navy and rocket forces, has hopes of trying to control the world's economies politically and semi-peacefully. Its leaders also know that their own country's future is balanced on a knife's edge. They import up to 70% of their oil and gas from overseas, and more than 70% of their food, as well as the raw materials that make up the fertilizer they need for the food they do produce themselves. It is abundantly clear that if China launches a war, any war, even one with a goal as small as retaking Taiwan, the world's markets will shut their doors to them, and their economy will simply grind to a halt. Within three months, they won't have enough fuel for their trucks and cars, and three months after after that, a famine will set in that will be catastrophic in its lethality. Another ray of hope is that relations between China and Russia are far from cordial. Despite Xi visiting Moscow, he left without making any concrete agreements in support of Russia. Xi has also been very reluctant to send lethal aid to Russia, in fear of 
the surprisingly strong sanctions put in place against Russia. He knows the same thing will happen if China invades Taiwan. So in a strange sense, the invasion of Ukraine and the universally strong response from nearly all of the NATO and EU members has perhaps reduced the likelihood of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. The sanctions against Russia have shown that any overt military actions that China makes would be catastrophic for its future, both politically and economically. For now, the possibility of an iron coalition between China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea against NATO will thankfully remain a simple exercise, a what-if scenario, with about as much chance of coming to fruition as Vladimir Putin has of sprouting a halo. Now go check out Russia just lost the biggest tank battle of the Ukraine war, or click this other video instead.